uh, yeah, our speakers that are going to give amazing talks. So we are really glad that people are here. And yeah, well, in the name of SWIS and uh, in representation of all the students that are here going to listen to Caroline and to Luis, we are really thankful and we feel really honored to have you here, guys, and thank you so much. So maybe we can start now. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, the presentation from Luis Serrano. Uh, just a little bit of his background. Uh, while he was studying at Harvard, he was part of a student project team that worked on the navigation paths of artificial intelligence performance models for the INSIGHT mission. In simple words, uh, what they were trying to achieve was to be able to give human-like ca capabilities to the lander so that it could leverage on all the different sensors, telemetry de devices and probes smart enough to be able to make decisions on its own and in a completely unknown environment. Uh, this class was given by MIT and Harvard professors. So. Thank you so much, Luis, for giving us your time. And I'm gonna give you the, the microphone so you can start now. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, guys. Um, can you please let me know whether you are seeing my screen? Yes, we can. And if I hit on play, what are you guys seeing? Uh, we're looking at the image that says, let's go to Mars. Okay, perfect. So, um, yes, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a real honor to be at, the, at this presentation and also to be able to hopefully share some of my experiences working with the INSIGHT um, team. So, um, I would like to start um, by, you know, start talking about how, how to, to get to Mars. Because um, every every single mission has uh, different stages, and in this particular mission, um, um, a huge part of the mission was to be able to get from planet Earth to to Mars. So um, that was one of the of the biggest challenges on on, on this specific mission, and um, I think that um, Caroline would actually give more detail on on what was the mission about, uh, but. Um, our our main focus on on that specific part of the project that that we helped in was to be able to give, as you were saying, human like capabilities to the probes and to the lander, so that it could take um, very different decisions um, when it comes to flight paths and when it comes to to, to cruise um, from planet Earth to to Mars. So um, in order to be able to get to Mars, um, even though it sounds very easy, um, it's a bit more complicated than, uh, than how it sounds. So in order to get to Mars, first we have to start thinking about, but, but you know, we first need to get out of, of our planet. So how do we get our, um, out of our planet um, and specifically into a, you know, a flight path that it's very, very far away from, from planet Earth? Um, um, I would like to to just go briefly through some of the stages of going out of our planet, and um, I would make a specific uh, assessment on one or one of the key points of this mission. Um, when we launched this this rocket, um, there is a very cool fun fact about this um, launch, and was the, the the fact that we were able to launch this rocket from the west coast instead of the east coast. Because most of the of the um, of the of the rockets launch from the east coast, and that's because of of a reason. That's not a pure coincidence. Um, most of the of the rockets are launched from Kennedy Space Center on, on the on the east coast, because we want them to go eastward um, for for a specific reason. When you launch a rocket, um, you go in a vertical flight path for some minutes, and after a while, you start turning your way eastward. So that you could use um, the same rotation movement of the Earth um, and the momentum that it's being created with that rotation movement to help the rocket go through our atmosphere in a more efficient way. So that's 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 how we we do things in in common in common missions. But in this specific uh, mission, it was a bit different. 
we did the whole launch from the West Coast. This was the first Mars mission that was launched from the West Coast. And it, it was um, done during uh, May the 5th. And, and the main reason we, we chose this date was um, because of some of the, because of the position of, the, of, of, of Mars and, and, and the Earth later on. And I would get into more, into more detail um, in a bit. So when we launch this, this rocket from the West Coast, um, we were using the Atlas V one rocket. And that's a three-stage rocket. Um, and by stages, what I mean is essentially that you have three different stages. The first stage is where you use the, the solid, um, solid fuel rocket boosters um, and to, to get out of our, of our um, atmosphere. So when you launch, you go through our atmosphere. Once you reach the Kármán line, which is essentially the boundary between the atmospheres and the on outer space, which is located above um, around 100 kilometers above the above ground um you use the first stage of that rocket then you start the second stage of, of the rocket to keep moving forward along the orbit of of the earth and um after a while uh the third stage comes in but before going into the third stage um this specific mission had uh, a very cool fun fact and and the other uh, this this fact was that with the rocket, with the space um, vehicle, we launched as well two, um, two satellites. And these satellites were called the Mars Cube satellites. And, and we referred to them afterwards um, like as, as Marcos. So we took the rocket, flew all the way through our atmosphere. We went out into outer space. And um, once we were out on, on, on the space, um, one of these, uh, b before getting into our third stage, which was the final stage, um, in order to start cruising all the way through, through outer space um, towards Mars, uh, we deployed these two um, satellites. So once the third stage, which was the final stage of the vehicle in order to be able to reach uh, the Martian atmosphere was deployed, after that happened, we deployed as well um, two of these, um, two of these um, satellites. And the main reason of doing that is because uh, we wanted to be able, once the lander reached the, um, the Martian atmosphere, to be able to, to relay the communication between the lander and the Earth um, with a, trying to achieve a near um, real-time communication. And, and, and that's because of the long distance that you have to um, the, the communication has to go through in order to be able to communicate with lander. Um, there is a latency that you can expect um, between Earth and Mars, which is around eight minutes. So what that means is essentially that if I am on Earth and Bruce is at Mars, um, and let's just for a second imagine that I can take my cell phone and try to call Bruce that he is on Mars. Um, and when he picks up, he says, hello, and I have to wait eight minutes for that hello to come all the way to Earth so that I can say, hey, Bruce. And that hey, Bruce would take, again, um, some other additional eight minutes in order to reach um, Bruce. So it is, as you can imagine, it, it's a bit of a boring conversation because it, it, it takes a lot of, of, of time. But also this distance affects the communication between Zlander and the, the team who is actually trying to, to route the, the lander from Earth. Um, so these two Marcos fly by um, right after the, the lander so that they could uh, be positioned in a very specific way once the lander reaches uh, the Martian atmosphere so that they could relay the communication from that lander back to Earth and we could have a very close to real-time communication into that point. And the other cool thing about the, the date that was chosen was because we wanted to be able to reach the Martian atmosphere in a stage where it was closer to Earth. If we see um, in this specific mission, uh, we wanted to achieve Mars when it was closer to Earth, and that happens every 26 months. So at the date of the launch, um, which is in the lower uh, left-hand side, uh, that's where we did the launch of the 
of the of the mission and six months later um in november we were able to reach the martian the martian um atmosphere and at that point is where both orbits the orbit of the earth and the orbit of mars are very close together that's now as, as i was saying that happens every every 26 months so um along the way the, the 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 whole thing and, and and all the work that we put into all these flight paths and all the different systems that um are on board this this mission um we're there for a reason um even though there are some uh, there are a lot of people at, at at earth trying to make the adjustments and trying to do the fine tuning of the path um in order to be able to cruise all the way to mars um there is some times where we don't uh, have real time communication with the with the with the lander so um there are a lot of different systems working on the lander as sensors we have um we have gyroscopes on board we have um um different probes we have different sensors we have in this in this specific um space vehicle we have something very cool which was um a star locator so we we wanted to be able to to have on board a systems that in a way would be able to determine whether um, that place over there was where outer space was located and on this over place over here was, was the sun. So we wanted to be able to know for sure um, uh, what was the, the right specific location, um, which is, that's, that's another challenge when, you, when it comes to space because you don't have, um, you don't have locations. You, well, well, you're in outer space, you don't have right or left or up or, or, or down. Um, it's a very, it's a bit more complicated than 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 how it is on, on Earth. So this TCM one, two, up to six, what we call TCM, that's the trajectory correction maneuvers, and those are essentially points through our path um, where we need to adjust and do the fine tuning of of the trajectory or the path that we're flying in order to achieve Mars. Um, at the right point and at the right window, because we don't want to go through Mars and don't be able to to land there. So in this specific, um, yeah, did some someone have a question? Nope. Okay. So uh, what we were we were trying to achieve was to be able to land on Elysium Planitia. Elysium Planitia. It's a, it's a place located very close to the equator of Mars. And if we try to take the planet and open, a, open it up, like if it were a plane, um, um, that point over there where it says inside um, is where we were trying to, to land. And there is a very cool explanation of why we choose that, that specific point. But um, <clears throat> in, in general terms, that's a very, um, that's a very good place to land when, when it comes down to trying to extract information and trying to take samples um, for further analysis. Um, so as I was mentioning, there are five different stages. Um, my participation and, and my, my team's participation was, was to, to help um, send over some codes and some, send them over um, a bunch of coding lines um, to, to help them improved the way um, the algorithms and the way the computers is the, the computers that were on board uh, were able to to determine the right path and and, and all of you obviously to be able to make decisions like like a human uh, once the lander was on its own uh, uh, most of our work was focused on <clears throat> on the first five stages and the real magic happens afterwards where caroline's um, um, uh, work is 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 more um, um, get it, getting deeper into it. Um, um, so um, this is a this is that's me on on the back uh, of that picture. Um, this was the day that we were um, given the the final the final details on the on the final um, lines of code in order to be able to deliver that to to the inside um, team. So that folk over there that's standing right next to me, that's my professor, basically. Uh, his name is um, Stratos Idreos. And that guy over there on the right-hand side, that's Richard, that's my, my teammate. And um, as you could actually figure out, um, back then we, we, we needed a lot of fuel in order to be able to log that um, long time um, on, on coding processes. 
So I am, I am pretty sure that we didn't have an apple in there, but I, I am pretty sure that we have a lot of coffee and probably some donuts. Um, so what we have on the right hand side of the of the of the of the slide is the Kalman filter, and uh, this is a very um, simple version of what a Kalman filter is. And this is essentially all the all the work that we did into this project was based on. A Kalman filter is essentially an aesthetic, a, a statistical model that takes information from historical data and takes information in real time and mixed all this together into one single model to be able to determine what's the, what's the best decision based on the information that we have. Uh, most of, of navigational systems work around Kalman filters, and this is how spacecrafts make decision on its own and how this is also used on rovers that are on Mars and rovers that are, um, that are being tested in order to be able to take information and, and take um, previous data to, to make final decisions. Um, all of this work turned out to be uh, a lot of, of, of coding lines, as I was saying. Um, at the end, the final stage of the, of the mission was to be able to deploy all the different equipments that were um, going to be used in order to determine um, Mars internal structure and internal behavior as, as, as one of the main goals of the mission was. So that's um, that's my my experience working around um, the inside the Mars inside mission. Um, it was a very cool experience. I think that it was very enriching, um, and, and we we did learn a lot from from these folks, um, and and it was you know a very a very cool experience at all. So I don't know if you guys have any question, um, but please feel free to to ask whatever you want. Um, I can I can answer in Spanish as well. Si quieren hacer preguntas en español también se vale, no hay ningún problema. Um, I have a question. Sure. So I was wondering, just because uh, earlier in the year I went to see Vasemir, or at least the, the Costa Rican version of Vasemir that um, Franklin Chang has in Liberia, and I was wondering what would be the role in all this uh, project of developing that? I mean, like now, Elon Musk, and I know NASA is working long term on developing. Uh, a real plan to go to Mars, uh, this kind of like really low energy, high efficiency motors such as Vasemir, or are we gonna be reliant on more, let's say, regular types of motors as the ones that we're using right now to send um, like people and, and, and cargo to the International Space Station and uh, motors that we're using as well to for the Artemis project uh, for Moon? Uh, no, I, I think that um, uh, the, the actual model of using um, solid rocket boosters, um, it's a very archaic uh, model. Um, and um, that's a very good question because um, one of the, of the differences that actually makes outer um, or deep space exploration possible is um, the use of these types of technology, as you were mentioning. Uh, the Basimir, um, it's a very, it's a very cool project, and it's and and the basis of the Basimir um, are uh, based on what we call um, SEP, which is solar electricity propulsion. And basically, what we do on that specific type of propulsion is that we take, uh, we open the probes, and that's the technology that we used in order to get to Mars um, for this mission. You open the probes once the third stage of the of the rocket is it's um, launched, and um, continuously that that um, those probes are taking energy out of the sun, and um, essentially what you end up with is a lot of different particles that are being electrically charged, and um, the way in which you expel those throughout the um, on the when you try to do the thrust. Um, it's a very efficient way of, of, of going through through space. Um, it all depends on how much time you have, um, because solar electric uh, propulsion it's very efficient because you have a continuous um, fuel which is the sun. But the problem with that specific type of propulsion is that you you have just a tenth of or a thousandth part of the of the 
propulsion that you can actually get out of a rocket, of, of a solid rocket booster. So it takes six months to get to Mars because we are using a very highly efficient because it doesn't burn out um, um, in this specific way of getting there. However, it's very slow. Um, even though the, the, the exhaust of these particulars, uh, of these particles, of these ions, um, out of, of, of the vehicle in order to, to push the vehicle forward um, are more efficient than in a rocket booster. Um, um, even though that is the fact, um, it's not as fast as, as we would like to, to, we would like it to be. Um, at the end, the exhaust of a, of a solid rocket booster um, goes at a speed of five kilometers per second. And when you have an ionized engine, um, you can reach 90 kilometers per second of exhaust. So it, it increases in a, very, um, in a very drastic way of the speed of how you thrust. Uh, however, it's not as efficient when it comes to time because the, 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 the force that you can actually make with that type of engine, it's, it's very, very small. So what we're trying to do is uh, the Vasimir is taking this specific concept of trying to work around um, solar electric propulsion and try to make that engine uh, more reliable in terms of time and also in terms of, of propulsion at the end. But no, we are not taking, we don't foresee to be able to use the, the solid rocket boosters for, for deep space um, exploration. Perfect, thank you. Sure. Any other question? Uh, yeah, uh, I think we can uh, continue with Caroline and after the, her presentation, we can do just like one set of questions and answers if you agree. Perfect, let's, mm -hmm. let's, keep, let's keep going. Okay, so uh, now we're going with Caroline working uh, as a background, uh, we have like Earth Planetary and Space Science Seismology Professor Caroline Beggin works at the University of California, Los Angeles. Caroline is one of the few scientists who were selected to join the Insight Science team as part of NASA's Participating Scientist Program. She uses seismic signals generated by Mars quakes to map the planet's deep interior. Her contribution helps determine the thickness and structure of the mantle, which will improve our, our knowledge of the thermal state of the interior of the planet and help uncover how Mars and other rocky planets form. So we're really glad having Caroline as well here, and we're really excited about her uh, presentation. So Caroline, you can continue, thank you. Here we go. Maybe if I unmute myself, it will be better. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for having uh, invited me to this. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I spent most of my career working on Earth. And I joined the InSight mission about a year and a half ago. Um, I was selected um, as a, to, to join as a participating scientist. So looking at other planets is really new for me and it's really exciting um, and uh, very different from what I'm used to. Um, and so I, I want to, to show you a little bit of uh, what's next uh, after, you know, after it's launched, after the, the, the mission goes to space and when, once we land, uh, I want to show you, uh, talk about the goals of the mission, and talk a little bit about the different instruments that were sent, but I'm going to focus mostly on the seismic instruments because that's my specialty. And I'll show you some of the first data we've collected now that we've been there for a little over a year. Um, so I like to show this slide that was uh, presented at um, one of our big meetings in San Francisco last December by Bruce Bannert, who is the main PI of the mission. And this is a list of the science team, which is like 200 people 
I'm only in one little piece of the puzzle. And, uh, and that doesn't even account for all the engineers and programmers who worked really hard before even the mission left Earth. Uh, and, and some of them are still working on, on it now. Uh, so there's a lot of people involved. Um, so one of the things that we're interested in as planetary scientists is to try to understand how planets form and evolve. And we, we think that all the rocky planets formed via the same process at about the same time, this by aggregation of little pieces, little rocks that were attracted to each other by gravitational attraction. They, the, they, they started to collide and form a bigger and bigger mass, a, a protoplanet, and then the heavy elements like iron usually tend to go toward the center and form a core. That's at least what we think is happening in most cases. Uh, and then to end up with a planet as we, we know them today. Um, there we go. And even though all these planets probably started in the same way, they do vary a lot uh, on the outside and on the inside, most likely. Uh, so we know Earth very well, right? We know we have water on Earth at the surface. We have life. We have continents and oceans with active plate tectonics and seismicity. We know the structure inside the Earth really well. We have a crust, a mantle. Uh, a solid inner core, an out, a liquid outer core. We know a lot of the details of the inside of the of Earth. Uh, but we know a little bit about the moon. Uh, we know we have a crust and a core and a mantle. We know it's pretty cold, uh, but we don't know exactly how big the core is. Uh, and then if we look at Mercury and Venus, Mars, they all, they all are different at some level. Some have atmo atmospheres, some don't, some have plate tectonics, some don't, some have a liquid core, some have maybe a solid core, Earth has both. Anyway, so one of the, point, one of the main of goals of the InSight mission is to try to figure out how do we end up with such different planets when we start from the same Point, and also how different really are they? Because until we can go look inside these planets, we don't actually know that much. We have some data, but not, not, not as much as we would like. So with for Earth, we have over a hundred years of seismic data and geology that we have collected. And uh, we know that it's very active seismically. And uh, as we're going to see in a couple of slides, the, the, seis the seismic activity on Earth is helping us figuring out what's inside the Earth. And that itself helps us understand how Earth evolves in time. And we have some data from on the, for the moon from the Apollo missions, uh, where seismometers were deployed and also rocks were returned. So we do know that it's uh, colder. I mean, the planet itself, it's not technically a planet, but the inside is much colder than, than Earth. Uh, it's also much more quiet uh, seismically. Uh, there's, there's some quakes, but much less than on Earth. And what about Mars? Mars is in between Earth and the moon in terms of size. And so we think it has a core, uh, but we don't know how big and we don't know if uh, it's solid or liquid. And so one of the things the InSight mission is trying to figure out is how active is Mars today, tectonically speaking, uh, how young is the surface, which we can figure out by looking at the craters. Uh, so we want to know if it's seismically active and how, uh, how often are the quakes, uh, how big are they? Um, where are they located uh, inside the planet? Is it deep? Is it shallow? Is it more located toward the poles or the equator or randomly a little bit everywhere? Uh, and then we, we uh, will also be able to look, uh, this listen for meteorite impacts on Mars uh, with the, the mission. 
And then, as I mentioned, we also would like to know what the size of the core is, how, whether it's liquid or solid, what it's made of, uh, the thickness and structure of the crust and the mantle. And all this is going to help us figure out how warm the interior of the planet is. Uh, because, and that's important because if it's the warmer it is, it means that the initial or initial heat uh, that was inside the planet when it formed didn't escape as much as if the planet was colder today. So that tells us something about the how the the, the planet is uh, liberating heat uh, and, and cooling down with time. So. On Earth, uh, yeah, if you, I, I hope you can see the, the videos I'm playing here. There will be a few. Um, I've had mixed successes with Zoom, so uh, hopefully th this one is working. So on Earth, we, um, we listen to earthquakes uh, with a network of seismographs, seismometers that are uh, spread all over the, the globe, mostly oh. on continents. Uh, some are also in the oceans. And so on Earth, a lot of the time, the major source of ground motion is uh, when you have a fault uh, and it moves, uh, usually due to plate tectonics motion. And when the fault moves, the energy that was accumulated in the rocks uh, gets liberated in the form of seismic waves. And so these waves, do this again, these waves propagate uh, through the interior of the earth and they make the ground on the surface vibrate and we can record that vibration. Uh, I am unable to switch slide now. Ah, here we go. Um, and typically on, on earth we get different types of seismic waves that propagate from the source to the receiver and we always get first what we call a P wave which is a compressional wave you can see here it's a series of compressions and dilatations that propagate through the inside of the planet uh, and then we get shear waves so this is a shear motion uh, as shown here they uh, travel more slowly than P waves so they arrive after the P waves and uh, after that we can get surface waves. So these are the waves that propagate uh, at the surface of the earth. They're trapped basically uh, in the shallow subsurface. And we can use the properties of these waves uh, to figure out what's inside the planet basically. So um, just like sound waves or, or light waves, any kind of waves, uh, seismic waves, uh, th they will travel inside the planet and the path they take is informing us on what they saw basically. So they can reflect off some boundaries like the core mental boundary for instance, or some blobs of material. You could have some feature inside the planet that would make the waves bounce back. Uh, and then they can refract as well. Uh, this is an animation here by uh, the iris. Uh, and so the path these waves take and how fast they travel uh, is telling us a lot about the structure they, they see when they travel inside the planet. So that can tell us uh, how, how warm the planet is. Uh, a seismic wave tends to go faster if it goes through something cold. It tends to slow down if it goes through something warm. So that can tell us a lot about the properties, internal properties, and the different layers of the planet. Um, ah, no. There we go. Now, what can cause the seismic signal on, uh, on Mars? So on Earth, we, um, on Earth, we have earthquakes due to tectonic activity, fault motion, uh, they, there's lots of uh, other sources of motion, ground motion, that beside that, there's volca volcanic activities, uh, just people walking around, a, a car passing by, a train, uh, ocean waves, all this can create a seismic signal. 
Now on Mars, uh, the more like, most likely sources of seismic signal that we think uh, are, might be available as faults, just like on Earth. We know Mars has a bunch of faults. We can, you know, there's different rovers that have been on Mars that have been looking at the, 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 the landscape and we have evidence that there, there, are, there are faults on Mars. There's, there's a lot of faults, but whether they're active or not, is something we don't know uh, unless we listen for uh, the motion basically by putting a seismometer on Mars that's going to tell us whether these faults are still active or not. Uh, also the tides uh, created by Mars, Moon, Phobos mostly uh, are also going to be a source of seismic signal, different source, but that might also, uh, that, that if we can observe it, it's going to tell us something about the interior of the planet. And then meteorite impacts. Uh, we, we know there, there are meteorite impacts on Mars, uh, not as much as on the moon probably, uh, but they are there and every time something bangs on the planet, it makes the planet shake. And so this is a signal we can record and we can use all these different signals to map things back down inside the planet. So back to insight. Uh, so the landing site uh, over here, the, the red star. So this is where we landed and uh, it was selected. Again, that's before I even joined the mission. I, I, the mission has been, people worked on this mission for years before I even I showed up. So uh, the, the site was selected because uh, it's relatively flat, it's flat, smooth plane, just like uh, our the, the Bruce Banner always jokes, it's like a, a grocery store parking lot it needs to be flat and boring because uh, you don't want to have too much background noise uh, when you're trying to listen for the quakes. So we want, you need to be flat. Also, flat is better for putting the instrument. You want it to be flat so that you know where up and down is and north, south, east, west. Uh, and then it would, the, 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 the site was also selected because, uh, again, the, there's lots of faults and uh, especially the faults over here um, in Severus Fosse. Uh, I, I'm not going to try to pronounce the names, I'm really terrible. But uh, anyway, there's a bunch of faults uh, that could still be active, uh, that are not right next to it, but not too far. So that was an ideal location uh, to, to try to listen to the potential motion of these faults. Again, there's also other source of possible vibration, uh, other possible source for these for ground vibration, uh, besides fault motion, there could be also uh, some volcanic tremors, there's volcanoes on Mars, we don't know if they're still active, but if they are, we would be able to listen to that. Uh, there's uh, potential for landslides and, and things like that. So the, the, the InSight lander, um, had uh, a lot of different geophysical instruments. It's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, this is uh, a, a re representation of the of the lander here, and you can see um, there was beside the seismic instrument here, which I'm going to talk about a little more in a minute. Uh, there is also a heat probe. You can see here, which if you have been following the news, you know that it's been having a lot of problems. It was supposed to dig down uh, a few uh, kilometers uh, and it got stuck close to the surface very fast. Um, I, I, I see that I have a question so I, I'll finish this slide and then I'll answer the question. Uh, but, but so the, the heat probe has been making progress more recently so now we know it's below the ground and uh, it's, it's, it's made enough progress to make us happy, but it was a little scary for a while. It was not doing well. Uh, so this heat probe is going to measure the heat flow coming out of the, uh, the interior of the planet. Uh, so the, to come back to the lander, there's also a robotic arm that uh, was in, that has been used 
to uh, move the instrument, the seismic instrument, from the, the, the deck to the ground. Uh, and it's also uh, equipped with a camera. So that's uh, the pictures you've been seeing uh, have been taken with this camera. It has a temperature and wind sensor. It has a whole, uh, a whole suite of instruments to look at the, the atmosphere of Mars. And it has solar panels for the power. It has antennas that are able to uh, locate very precisely the location of the planet, which uh, in, in turn is allowing us to look at the wobble of the planet. And that is also going to tell us whether the core is liquid or not. Um, and I think I've covered the different instruments. So the question I got here uh, is, how can you determine if the core is solid or liquid? Uh, can the seismic waves tell that? Yes. Uh, so I did not put these slides in this talk because it would take me, make the talk way too long. Uh, but uh, so as I mentioned, we, we detect on Earth P and S waves. Uh, one specific thing about the she wave, the S wave, is that they cannot propagate through fluids. So if you see P waves and you don't see shear waves, well, it could be the signal is not good enough, but it can, also, it can also be due to the fact that the wave went through something liquid. So that's one type of information we can gather to figure out whether the core is solid or liquid. Uh, and also when a wave uh, goes down from the surface to the core and then bounce back to the surface or refract uh, inside the, the, the core, the, the contrast of uh, the, the, the rock properties between the bottom of the mantle and the core is also going to give us some information about whether the, the core is liquid or solid. Um, and there's, there's more questions, but I think we should maybe keep them for, for the end, of, <laughs> otherwise we'll never finish. But I'm happy to answer them, but I think maybe at the end of the talk would be better. Uh, so keep keep writing them down. Uh, so there's a seismometer here. So that's a, a picture of the, uh, the the outside of the seismometer. There's lots of electronics inside this. Uh, it's a, a wonderful instrument. Uh, it's it has actually two different types of sensors. It has one that can measure really short, very high frequency waves, and one that can record a broader range of frequencies. Uh, that are good to look deeper, deep in the planet. And it's as good as any good seismometer we have on Earth. And it can uh, measure displacements of uh, 10 to the minus 10 meters, so the size of a hydrogen atom, which is really amazing when you think about it. Um, but th but that's, that's what we needed and that's what it does. And so these, this is a rendering here of the instrument uh, underneath its many layers. You can see all the electronics, that's not my specialty, but there's lots of engineering that went behind this. Uh, and here you can see in the lab, they were practicing putting it down on the ground with the grapple. Uh, and what you see over there is a, a wind shield, a wind and temperature shield that has to be uh, put on top of the instrument uh, to protect it from large temperature variations and uh, the wind on Mars. So uh, as was mentioned before, it was the first planetary, uh, interplanetary mission that left from the US West Coast. I was not part of the mission when it left, so I did not get the chance to go see the, lo the lounge, but as I heard that the weather was not good enough and it was dark, it was at night, well, very early morning, uh, that uh, people who went there, they actually did, they didn't see anything, so I guess I didn't miss too much. Uh, and, and then we saw this picture already before, so inside landed here. Uh, to give you an idea compared to the other missions that have landed. Uh, only the Viking missions had seismometers. Those were in the 80s or 90s, 80s, I guess. Uh, those was not successful seismic mission because uh, the instrument was staying on deck. It wasn't deployed to the ground. And so it, there was a lot of noise and it was very sensitive to the wind. So all it ended up recording was the wind which was not the goal, but that's, that's what happened. That's why for inside, it was decided that the instrument really needed to be on the ground. 
so that was part of um, part of why uh, the instrument has been put on the ground now for this mission. So that's uh, I, I was part of the mission uh, for when the, the the lander landed on Mars. So that was really exciting. That's probably the most exciting part of my career, uh, being in the room with a lot of the people who are part of the mission. When it's landing, it was very stressful because we didn't know it was going to be successful. We were hoping, but you never know until the last minute if it's, if it's going to work and it did. And so it was really, really amazing to be there for that. Um, and so this is the first picture, very dusty picture that was taken by the lander right you know, just as, after it landed. Uh, this is a cleaned up version of the picture. Uh, and so uh, soon after the, the, the lander landed on Mars, the solar panels were deployed. This is obviously a, an animation, a rendering. Uh, so they were deployed, and uh, one of the first pictures, these are from some of the first pictures that were taken uh, using the camera that was on the uh, robotic arm. So you could see how flat, nicely flat, uh, the, the area is, uh, where the, 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 the lander uh, ended up, which was good. Uh, but you can see here there's, some, there's a slope, so we're really probably inside a little bit of a crater and there's some big rocks there. Uh, so it's, it's good we avoided being landing there, for instance, that would not have been uh, so good for the, the instrument, though I'm sure we would have found a way around. But um, So it worked out. And um, so the instrument was on deck for a while. And uh, but it, as soon as it turned on, it started to record. And uh, the first thing it recorded was the Martian wind. And so I'm going to play this uh, video. Hopefully you'll hear the sound. Um, and uh, it, it will probably be very quiet in, in the beginning. I'll let you enjoy this. Touchdown confirmed. Yeah, so that was pretty cool to recall the wind, but that's not what we wanted. So eventually the uh, uh, seismometer was deployed on the ground and that took a, a while, uh, see December 19, when and we landed on November 26. So it was not quite a month uh, until it was deployed, uh, but that's because it takes a long time to send the, you know, this one signal at a time to tell the, you know, the robot what to do uh, and so so it took it took a little while but that was successful it was deployed and and that's a picture here uh, of the instrument deployed here and then we put the uh, wind and temperature sensor uh, uh, 
a shield on top of it. So uh, that happened on in Feb early February 2019. And then that's when we started to record the, uh, the ground motion, uh, really the ground motion, not, not just the wind on the deck. Um, and so, Sol 128, so Sol refers to a day on Mars. It's not quite exactly a day on Earth uh, because of the different rotation period of the, the two planets. Uh, but that's when we first detected the, mo the, the first likely Mars quake. So that was super exciting. For weeks and weeks, we were waiting and waiting and starting to lose a little bit of hope, but because we were very impatient, probably, but then we, we got we got an, an event. And so these different figures here, you can see um, the top left is showing you the acceleration of the ground in meters per second square, uh, 10 to the minus six. And here, this is time on the horizontal axis. And uh, dark blue is the east-west motion, ground motion. Light blue is north-south. And black is the vertical up and down motion of the ground. And uh, th there's a bunch of things happening. And then uh, you see the dashed line here is indicating where the P wave is arriving. And then the, the little dotted line is where the S wave arrives. If I saw this on Earth, I would not. This is not what we see on Earth. This is very different. The P and S waves are much more clear on Earth. Uh, and so there's lots of processing, data processing that had to be done to actually figure out that there was a P wave and an S wave here. And this is what you see on the top right figure uh, where you have the frequency of the waves on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And the color scale represents the the, the, the energy of the signal, basically. So there was wind, the thing that you see here is the wind and the noise, basically. And then you see a burst of energy here at these frequencies between six and nine hertz, eight or nine hertz. So uh, that indicated the P wave. And then a, a stronger burst of energy over here, over a broader frequency range that was uh, identified as being a, a no, I, I shouldn't say that. It's not an S. Is it an S wave? No, I don't think it's an S wave. Sorry. I've, uh, yeah, so I'm mixing my, my pencils here. Uh, but definitely we had a P wave uh, and we had to do some processing to, to see it, to, to confirm that, that there was a pulse of energy here. Uh, in pink, you have the pressure, the, 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 air, the, the ambient pressure, uh, air pressure that is being recorded because we want to make sure that when we detect something on the seismogram, it's not due to the wind or something happening in the atmosphere. And you can see that there was nothing sp uh, visible on uh, in the pressure uh, sensor, nothing happening at those specific times, which gave us confidence that what we see here is actually due to some, some ground motion due to, we don't know what, uh, we didn't know what at the time, uh, but, you know, we were hoping it was a tectonic event. Um, and yes, so here I have another movie that is showing you that uh, quake that I just showed you. And uh, it's been, um, the recording has been accelerated to be in the uh, audible range, uh, frequency range. And so initially you're going to listen to the wind like we did earlier, and then you're going to see, to hear how different a quake is and then we finish with the the recording of the robotic arm because every time the robotic arm moves it's making some motion and some vibration that the seismometer is able to pick up oops okay let's play this
yeah so so that, that was that was really neat so um yeah so that was uh so 128 yes 128 um uh, so 173 so 128 only had a, a clear p wave potentially an s wave but definitely a p wave so 173 was the second one we recorded and for that one we were we we're sure that we detected both a p and an s wave so you can see this 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 is a busy figure here but uh this is an energy plot like i showed earlier in pink and and, and purple and then here this is this actual seismograph here and you can see that it's noisy 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 and then a p wave arrives and then the s wave arrived here and that was recognizable also in the spectrum with the energy a burst here for the p wave and then another clear burst here for the s wave uh, you also will notice that the p wave wave train lasts for three minutes and the s wave train lasts for 11 minutes and that is really long on earth it's just a pulse a little tick and just a second or so uh, and on mars it's lasting a lot longer so that that's something very interesting uh, that's telling us something about the, the structure uh, the attenuation of the waves is definitely much less strong on mars than on earth so uh, two large events were recorded. So 173 that I showed you just now and Sol 235. So those two events had clear PNS waves. Um, so that's, that's, that's really neat. And as I said earlier, the fact that we have S waves means that these waves went through uh, solid rocks, not through a liquid. Now we know that uh, they were uh, not too far from the uh, the record the the seismic instrument, so that tells us that they didn't propagate as deep as the core. They're just sampling the very top of the mantle, but but it is it is what we got, and so that's sort of telling us that there there was no fluid layer in the top where these waves travel. Um, and we were able to determine how far these two events were from the um, instrument. And based on that, we drew circles telling us you know, how far the, 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 the seismic event was. And even though we cannot locate it more precisely than that in this case, uh, we were able to say to see that it this circle overlaps with this region here, Cerberus Fosse, which we suspected might be seismically active. It has a uh, fault there, uh, and so we are currently investigating what kind of fault motion could have given rise to the signal we've, we've observed. And this is a picture here. Uh, of this, the, this Severus Fosse uh, location, you can see the fault over there. So it's the fact that we detected a quake that uh, might be over there, at least the distance seems to match, uh, would tell us that it's still seismically active. We were able to use these data to uh, look, to do a, to get a first model of the seismic structure in the very shallow crusts. So it's not as deep as I want. I'm really interested in the very deep mantle and the core. Uh, but uh, with the first few data we got, the first few big quakes, we were able to constrain the structure of the crust. And by looking at the speed of seismic wave in different kind of material, we're able to, uh, well, we're not able to tell very much yet. <laughs> There's lots of possibilities, but uh, we can uh, maybe narrow down a little bit the kind of rocks we, uh, the crust, Mars crust is made of. We'll need a lot more data to, to narrow things down more, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll stay there for, for a while. Um, as of, so this slide was made in January. Um, and we had about 300 events uh, detected. And now most of them are not as nice as the one I showed you. A lot of them are really tiny. The ones I showed you were magnitude three or so. A lot of the, the other ones are magnitude one or two. And they are, they are they're kind of weird. We still actually don't know what they mean. 
Uh, but there's a lot of activity for sure on Mars. We're still trying to figure out what it is. Uh, but you also see um, that, uh, so this figure here is showing you uh, on the vertical axis is different days from February 2019, oops, 2019 to uh, February 2020. So that's one Earth year of data and every line basically is a day <laughs> that you cannot really see. But, uh, and then this is time, a day on Mars. And you can see that during the day on Mars, it's very yellow, which is telling you there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of wind, heavy wind, and that's making the instrument move. And so we're, we're not able to detect events during that time. It doesn't mean they don't happen. That's just that it's very noisy. And oh, um, but at night, at night that, that gets better. It's much more quiet. And that's when we can detect events much better. Uh, so, Mars is doing its thing, um, and it's giving us events. Uh, so the the as of January of this year, we had detected thirteen larger events, plus a bunch of no, a lot of tiny things that we are not sure what they are. They're called high frequency events. They're up there in the plot, uh, but the ones that we suspect might be seismic are here. Uh, and this is a figure that's giving you the number of events of magnitude larger than a certain threshold versus the magnitude. So we have magnitude twos and threes on Mars. Uh, to compare to Earth, uh, you know, the, in, in the most quiet places on Earth, this is the green curve, uh, we have uh, about uh, 100 times more events of that size on Earth in the most quiet parts of Earth. So it's, it's different. Mars is definitely more quiet than Earth, but it's also more seismically, more seismically active than the Moon. The Moon is located here. Uh, it has some small size events, uh, but less than on Mars. And what we're really hoping is to get some more events that would fit down here, that would be bigger magnitude because the bigger magnitude events are more likely to give us clear signals of waves that go deeper. Um, one of the last figures uh, I want to show is this one. So that's uh, comparing an earthquake on Earth. You can see it here, a very sharp P wave peak. Uh, and that's, uh, that's one in China. Uh, here we have an event. Uh, don't know where that is located, but you can see how a different type of event on Earth, uh, as opposed to a mass quake in orange, that lasts more like 15 minutes, as opposed to a few seconds, possibly minutes on Earth. Uh, and a moon quake, a moon quake can last for over an hour. So these three planets are the three planets where we have size, for which we have seismic data, and they are very different. And so that's really interesting. Uh, we don't know, every, every, we don't understand everything about that yet, but it's telling us something. So the, uh, this is telling us about the, the attenuation of the waves. So it's waves on Earth are attenuated much faster than on Mars and than on the Moon, uh, which is evident for how fractured the crust is. The more fractured, the more the way, the more fractured the crust, the more the waves are going to bounce, and this is what we're seeing for the moon. So there's probably some of that going on for Mars. Um, one cool thing about the Inside mission is that the data are available to the public. They're released every three months. The, there was a release in March, I believe. I think there was one in March. Uh, and uh, there is going to be one uh, very soon, uh, another one. So you can go on the iris.edu website and uh, you can look at the data, you can see the list of events and you can download them and you can do all kinds of cool things. Uh, so that's, yes, yeah, that's all I wanted to, to say about that. Um, yeah, so uh, stay tuned. There's a lot, we still, we still have a lot to learn um, about Mars. Amazing, thank you so much. It was so interesting.
Um, we have some questions. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think the first one is why Mars does not have an intrinsic global magnetic field and how do you train the algorithm of the seismograph before go to Mars? Uh, okay, so magnetic field, so that's not my specialty, so I'll, <laughs> I'll be uh, full disclosure. Uh, so we have measured actually the, the, the magnetic instruments that are on uh, that that came, that went to Mars with InSight, they, we did measure a magnetic field about 10 times stronger than we thought. Uh, but it's probably not global, as, as you said. Uh, and a reason why a planet does, if a planet does not have a global magnetic field, uh, would, could mean many things, but one of them could be that the core is not fluid, or maybe it's not not enough, not, not big enough. Uh, so to have a, 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 mag a general global magnetic field, you need like on Earth, a pretty decent sized fluid uh, core with uh, iron in the case of Earth, a conductor uh, that is, it's fluid and it, it needs to be convecting. So if it's convecting, uh, that's how it can uh, generate uh, a magnetic field. So on Mars, if it's, we, we think it, it had a magnetic field in the past. And uh, one reason the magnetic, magnetic field could sh turn off would be if uh, a lot of heat has already escaped out of the planet. That's one, re one possibility. Um, and then the other question about how do you train the algorithm of the seismogram before you go to Mars? Uh, well, the, the instrument itself is uh, just, it's, it's not, it's not, I mean, they're all, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, digital now, but the principle is basically uh, like the old seismometers we had on, on Earth in the past with springs, so it's a bunch of springs that move, uh, and, and you can record the motion. The algorithms we have to write uh, our algorithms to analyze the recordings of these waves and interpret them and, and, and try to map things back as structure inside the Earth. And we do that uh, on Earth routinely. We've been doing that for decades now, many decades. And uh, we had to adapt some code to Mars. Um, and we're still, we're still working on adapting codes. Uh, we don't really have to train a code ahead of time uh, to analyze the seismograms, but but we have to be clever about how we analyze these data because they're so different from what we get on Earth that, uh, I mean, it, it has left us a little puzzled at times. Uh, this Mars is so much more quiet than Earth, that, and the instrument is very sensitive, that we're recording signals, tiny signals, that even if we have the same signals on Earth, we would never be able to hear it because Earth is noisy. It has people, it has cars and trains and, and uh, wind and, and oceans. It has so many things that make the ground move all the time. The background noise is much higher on Earth than on Mars. So on Mars, we're seeing things that we've never seen before and we have to be clever to try to figure out what they mean. Um, yeah, I'm looking through the chat window here. Um, yeah, the next one says, how can you control where the device land in Mars? Ah, I don't know. <laughs> that's more a question for Louis. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that is way <laughs> out of my expertise there. <laughs> um, lots of so, clever engineering, but... <laughs> um, Actually, what you what you do is um, all of these flying patterns are already pre-programmed, so um, you cannot expect to have one precise point to land. Um, um, we we haven't achieved that level of of accuracy yet, but uh, we set the parameters um, to have a, a, a an area where you would like to land um, um, the device. And based on that, and, and also based on um, the trajectory that the lander has gone through in, in, the, in the previous ver in the previous 
segments of the mission, um, you can um, make the final adjustments to make sure that it lands on what on the place that you want it to to, to be uh, landing. Um, <clears throat> Even though these patterns are already pre-programmed, um, you 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 can do final adjustments adjustments at the end, um, and, and there's where the where the team at, on, on Earth um, comes comes along and and they do the final adjustments so that you can land um, on a very in a very precise way. Even though you don't you cannot have a, a very specific point to land, you can do that landing with a very um, fair confident level of accuracy. Um, but all of those are already pre-programmed. Um, next question is... Is uh, Mars mental uh -huh. cooling faster than Earth because smaller planets have a larger surface area to volume ratio? Yeah, that's, that's one of the thing we think because Mars is kind of in between Earth and the Moon in terms of size. We think it probably has lost more heat, more uh, initial heat than Earth, uh, and probably less than the Moon. So that yes, that's 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 correct. Uh, but that's something we want to check by putting the heat probe. Hopefully, it will eventually go down as deep as it should be, uh, and then looking at by mapping the path and the the, the the speed of the seismic wave inside the planet, we hope to be able eventually to uh, get a, a sense of how hot it is and how it changes laterally in terms of temperature and that's going to tell us something about how fast the planet might have cooled down. Uh, is there a way to search or detect water on Mars through seismic waves? Yes, certainly. Um, it's Again, the, the shear waves don't travel through fluids, so that's one way. Uh, also, um, attenuation, the way the, the waves attenuate is going to change depending on how much water there is. So looking at attenuation is definitely a, a very important thing to when you're trying to figure out if there is any water. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, the seismic waves behave very differently depending on the kind of, on the temperature of the rocks and the, their composition. So the more data we have, the more we'll be able to tell about the inside of the planet, whether there's water, whether there's, you know, what kind of rocks we have, et cetera, et cetera. Now the seismic waves, uh, the frequency of the waves we detect is going to limit the depth at which we can look. Uh, you probably already know that the, the higher frequency waves can map shallow structure, the longer period wave map deeper structure, but there's a, there's a threshold. We, with the loop, you know, pass it. That's, well, that's part of why we have a high frequency, uh, short period instrument on board, but uh, you really need high frequency waves to be able to detect them, uh, to, to map the very shallow structure. So if, if there's water, you know, very, very shallow, very shallow depth, it might be trickier to, to detect. So how that's, there's always trade-offs. Um, uh, Bruce was asking what might be the best region on Mars to establish human colonies underground? Huh, that's a good question. Uh, that, that's part of why we need to, to figure out where the seismicity is coming from because you don't want to put people in a place that, that is you know, moving a lot and would cause problems. Uh, so that, that's, that's one reason. That's also one that's nothing to do with Mars, but I'm part of another mission proposal to try to go back to the moon. Uh, and with the plans to actually put people on the moon very soon, it's becoming important to figure out where is the safest place. And looking at seismicity is definitely one thing we need to do. So I don't have an answer of where would be the best place on Mars, but that's Insight is one step toward figuring it out. Figuring it out. Um, there's one more question. 
what was the problem to make the hole in order to insert or oh, the, the the heat probe well that's a good question <laughs> so first the heat probe uh, so it's a self hammering heat probe so it's supposed to hammer itself down inside the, the, the subsurface and it was tested on earth and it worked for the and they tested different kind of soil uh, but when it got on Mars, it, uh, and you remember, there were so many things that happened <laughs> to this thing since, since a year and a half ago. Uh, I, I know in, initially it went down a little bit and then it jumped back up. And uh, the, the, so that, that was an issue. And uh, we don't understand why exactly, but it was probably the compaction level of the soil. Uh, there are some people who work in oil exploration who told us that they see that sometimes on Earth, that can happen. Uh, and so what the engineers, uh, there's amazing engineers who are working on Insight, and I would have given up on that probe a long time ago, but they, they have kept you know, trying to make it work. And so one thing they've, they tried is uh, because you cannot, there's no system to bring it back up and put it somewhere else that was going to be too expensive. So uh, this, that cannot happen. So what they were able to do is to take the, the scoop that is part of the robotic arm and tap on the ground next to the, the, the mole, the, the heat probe. So they tapped on the soil to compact it a little more and that seemed to have helped. It went down, and I know at some point there was more problems. It went back up a little bit, but I think now the latest I heard from a few days ago is that it is down, uh, and it hopefully keeps going down. Uh, but this was unexpected. Uh, first, we were wondering if it was stuck on a rock, but it doesn't look like it was. Uh, it, it was a little bit tilted, but that that wasn't. It wasn't stuck on a rock, and it was probably the the compaction of the ground. Amazing. Okay, okay there is another question for Luis. How do you know the CPS remaining are not taking corruption decisions and which will happen with CPUs in a couple of years? Um, that's actually a very good question. Um, <clears throat> so you cannot um, avoid glitches from, from happening. Um, they, they happen a lot of times. And um, even though um, the, the CPUs that are on board are, are very different CPUs, you know, when you take them and you try to compare them with the ones that we have on our regular computers, um, they are um, radiation hardened um, CPUs. That's what we call the, the rat hats. And um, those rat heads um, have the ability to, to try to avoid as much as we can the radiation. Um, but even though radiation, radiation happens all the time. So when glitches come along, uh, what we do is, um, there are a lot of different CPUs that are on our own, our own board. So basically what it does is, um, all of all of these systems. Um, and let me just go go one step back. When it comes down to the the main principle architecture of a CPU, um, for now nowadays for us, it's very common to to hear um, um, dual core processors and dual core and quad core, and you know you have a lot of different cores. Uh, but when it comes to CPUs that are being used on on spacecrafts, um, we are we we just a few years ago reached the the dual core um, um, milestone. So what we are doing right now is that we have um, a lot of different CPUs running at the same time, and when glitches occur in one of those um, CPUs, because it it will occur um, every time. Uh, what we do is that we restart that specific CPU, and once it it it, it restarts, um, it takes the information from the other CPUs and it, and it tries to sync up back again so that it, all of them um, try to process the same um, same information. 
if, if we take that specific uh, behavior of this of this um, um, CPUs and we try to go a bit back into those computers that we had on on the Apollo mission uh, back then what we what we used was to 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 have we had five different computers on board and all five computers tried to make the same calculation and based on that and and also using um, a democratic model what they did was they were requested the same calculation if three out of those five computers had one answer then that was the answer or that was the the path that we would follow when it comes to going through through space um, nowadays we don't use that however we based on that same model we use that same collaboration process on and we are leveraging on dual core processors so when one of them are restarted and and it goes back on it tries to sync back again with the with the remaining cpus <clears throat> but as the question was saying, what would happen if the, the other CPUs are already getting glitches as well? So there is always a second set and a third set and a fourth set of CPUs that are running. So uh, it, we, we should be <laughs> um, very unfortunate to have all of the systems um, failing at the same time. It's, it's very hard that that happens. It could happen but um it's very difficult for that to happen if it does then we have to you know we have to go through you know plan b plan c plan d <laughs> at the end um there would be always a human trying to make the the, the calculations if all if every single computer on board fails but um it's very hard for that to happen and uh what would happen to cpus in a couple of years well um cpus are, are trying to are evolving in a very fast fashion. Um, if we take missions, recent missions, like the one that we had um, on, on, on March um, for SpaceX, um, and we try to compare again with that to, to the Apollo mission. Um, we had five computers back then on the SpaceX mission. We had 50 computers on board. And all of those computers, um, even though we're very, very, very different from one another, um, all of them used the same Kelvin filters that I, that I was um, talking previously. So the, 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 ba the basic principles um, on both systems, even though one of them has a larger computational capacity, are very, very, very similar. Um, CPUs are, are, you know, are changing in a very fast fashion um, on personal computers. That's not the, the way it, it does on, on spacecrafts. Um, but for future CPUs, what we can see is that it would keep the same path that we followed when when it was for personal computers we first had the, the dual cores then we had the quad cores and so on and so forth so that's what we would see on the net in the coming years okay so that was the last question and i want to thank you guys um for the as a final activity we do have an ebook of the book that bruce co-authored that is a to the source costa rica at nasa and we're going to raffle it between the participants and it would be the the closure activity so Mo, if you mm -hmm. so there's the the list of the participants and we're going to choose the the name of the winner and then after the meeting we're gonna send an email to the winner that it will be oscar morera so yeah we're gonna send the code so he can uh, ask for the ebook and again thank you caroline thank you luis for giving us your time it was really interesting and we learned a lot so yeah thank you so much and i hope you guys and every single person in this meeting has a nice night a good night and a thanks night. caroline thanks, thank thanks, thank thanks, thanks luis and everyone thank you thank you so much thank you it was so cool thank you bye guys bye bye, bye, -bye.